This is Veronica Antwistle saying welcome to Paradigm Shifters, and our Paradigm Shifter today is Matthew Fox, who's bringing forward some of the deepening, I guess we'll say deepening ecumenical wisdom from Meister Eckhart from the 12th and 13th century. And Matthew Fox, once a Dominican priest, but actually seems quite proud of having been uh, doffed of your cloth, I think, uh, I would say, and moved on to being an Episcopalian priest, but is making huge, huge inroads in people's spiritual consciousness to help empower our species. So that was a long preamble, but welcome so much to our show Paradigm Shifters, Matthew Fox. Thank you, Veronica. I like the name of your show. <laughs> well, you're certainly one of those, aren't you? Well, I've been told a lot worse things, so I'm <laughs> I'm I'm open to that. You know, when you were talking title. about and when you're talking about your history and how you've run up against some of the uh rule bound uh well, like the dogmas, the religious groups, the political groups and so on, I'm really proud of your uh, having had the courage, I'm just really, really honored and impressed and inspired by your courage to just uh, move through those changes and take the rap or the names that they're calling you or whatever in order to be of a purer nature, I would say. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, I have always admired courage, and I look forward to others oh, yeah. so that I can uh, learn it. But uh Sometimes circumstances just uh, force you to take a stand, and I, I did stand up to Cardinal Ratzinger and the, and uh, the Vatican for uh, a number of decades because I thought they were talking nonsense about women and about gay people, and um, and uh, weren't talking at all about important things like ecology and the sacredness of creation, and. Um, and the, and the wisdom uh, traditions of the Bible, and and mm-hmm. the importance of of um, world of humanism, of you know, interfaith spirituality. What did you and, call uh, it? Ecumenism. Ecumenism, uh, yeah, deep ecumenism or interfaith. I remember the uh, big ecumenical the movement when I was a Catholic student years ago. Oh. It's a big movement, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Right, absolutely, mm-hmm. and of course, liberation theology in Latin America, which those two popes. Uh, purposefully uh, destroyed. One one missionary priest I talked to recently says he, he thinks Pope John Paul II murdered 10,000 people in Latin America. Wow. Because, yeah, because of their stand against liberation theology in based communities. They got a lot of people killed. And uh, um, Talk about the Crusades, huh? Well, exactly. But anyway, this new pope is different. Thank yeah. heavens. Yeah, he but, seems like he's got a lot of possibility, but be, the political machine being what it is, we're all kind of going, okay. Yeah, right. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. Well, he needs all the prayers he can get. But your exactly. latest, your latest book. Before we go too far in, I wanted to mention the name of your latest book called Meister Eckhart, a mystic war, warrior for our times. Not warrior, warrior, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> very different. Uh-huh. And uh, and the mystic. Well, I'll I'll let you talk about it, but one of the things I really, really have loved so far in this book is um, the depth, when you call it ecumen, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. Ecumenism. Yeah, and that's the depth of the, uh, what, the common threads of of beingness that run Mm -hmm. through every religion, every political thing, if we allow it. How did you get into all this anyway? How did you get into Meister Eckhart from from being a Dominican priest? Well, Eckhart was a Dominican, although he was condemned by the Pope in his day, a week after he died in the fort, early 14th century. Wow. And um, uh, but um, he followed right on Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican brother of his. He was 17 years old when Aquinas died, and he was 13 years old when Rumi died. Oh, really? So, uh, yeah, so he was very much a part of that era of great uh, mysticism and, and um, science, really. They were very interested, Aquinas certainly was, in cosmology and how the how nature worked. Aquinas, of course, borrowed from Aristotle, who was the best scientist that medieval ages came up with, and um, 
uh, all that inspired uh, Eckhart very much. But in all my training, 14 years training as a Dominican, I never heard Eckhart's name used once because he was condemned. But I really found him through Kumar Swami, the Hindu writer who wrote a great book on nature and art in the, in the 1930s. He wrote it, and uh, his old chapter on Eckhart. And um, and I quote from that chapter in this book. And um, Kumar Swami says that reading Eckhart is like reading the Upanishads, and uh, and that his his words often sound like a, a straight translation from the Sanskrit. He says, mm-hmm. "Well, that's tremendous uh, praise coming from a Hindu." Kumar Swami was a Hindu, and um, that's what's so amazing about Eckhart. As you said, he goes so deep uh, into his own soul and his own tradition that um, he joins the what I call the underground river of common wisdom. And um, my book, I think, this new book on Eckhart, this is my third book on Eckhart. I wrote two books previously, but over 30 years ago. Mm. And I've taught probably thousands of students uh, Eckhart over the years, and I've seen the tremendous impact he has on people's lives. But um, Well, let me interrupt you just for a sec, that I'm a long-term student of metaphysics and haven't read it. But reading this book, I'm going... Mm-hmm. My life is changing as I read it. Mm. Oh, how exciting. Yeah. Glad to hear that. Well, I'm also and a mystic, you know, and he talks. Right. Well, you there talk, you go. and he talks a lot about that deep sure. value, you know, in a way I have thought about. Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, he's one of the greatest of the Westerners, and we hardly know him again because he was condemned. And that's why he's, I think he's really, um, this is his time. His time has come. I think the 21st century, we can begin to grasp the depth of what he's about and the ecumenism, the interfaith, because, as you know from seeing the table of contents of the book, I put him in the room with Rabbi Heschel, mm-hmm. the great Jewish theologian, mm-hmm. put him in the room with, with uh, Kumar Swami and Father B. Griffiths, two experts at Hinduism, put him in the room with Tikvat Han because he's very Buddhist. Um, the great Japanese Buddhist philosopher Suzuki um, told Thomas Merton that Meister Eckhart was the one Zen thinker of the West, and that he should read Eckhart. And the result was that Merton was converted uh, in the year 1960. He spent reading just Eckhart and Zen poetry, and he entirely shifted, and he became a much more prophetic um, voice in the 1960s. And then he died at the end of the of the decade um, in the East, where he was traveling, and he kept a journal and in the margins, he would write, Eckhart is my lifeboat, Eckhart is my lifeboat. So Eckhart was hugely important to Thomas Merton, he was important to um, Suzuki and to Kumar Swansmi, I say, who, who said he was, he, he, it's like reading the Upanishads. And, and indigenous wisdom, too, I put him in the room with Black Elk and a chapter on shamanism, mm-hmm. because he has a lot in common with the indigenous tradition as well. And of course, Carl Jung says that he owes Eckhart Eckhart gave him the key to the unconscious. And Jung quotes Eckhart over 30 times, and he wrote a whole essay on Eckhart and the relativity of God. And um, he says that of all Christian thinkers, Eckhart was the one who gave him life when he when he read him. So Eckhart's um, influence has been immense. But I think what happens, at least for me, when I was reading it, we need to get into the women's part, too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, his thing about... Uh, isness and dropping mm-hmm. through all the God labels that we've gotten mm-hmm. into, all of that mm-hmm. just means so much. It's so mm-hmm. empowering to yes. read into that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm so glad you got that from him. Yeah, his wonderful line, I pray God to rid me of God. I think a lot of people have prayed that sentence uh, consciously or unconsciously over the centuries. And um uh, it opens the door to letting go and letting be, and, and as you say, isness. He says, isness is God. So that talks about the radical presence of the divine in all of being, and um, what he would call the cosmic Christ, and what the Buddhists would call the Buddha nature that is present in all things. It's very, very, uh, very, very touching. Also, um, when I was reading, oh, the names are are new to me, so forgive me that I don't quite remember Mm -hmm. the names, but there's a woman here, Adrienne Rich. Oh, yes. And uh, one of the things that intrigued me, and I think it was weaving through all of them, actually, but hers was the most poignant as far as bringing it up, which is 
if you want to get into your spiritual and into the essence of the isness, I guess, you go through, and I, it was said in more than one place, but you go through things like grief, right, and loss. Yes. And one of them you said in go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely. Um, that's what the mystics call the via negativa, the dark night of the soul. And uh, Eckhart says, if you want the kernel, you must break the shell. So there is a, a, well, and he talks about breakthrough. In fact, he invented the word breakthrough in German, Dirkbrook. Oh, really? And he says, in breakthrough, I learned that God and I are one. So there is a breakdown, there's breakthrough. Um, and and Adrian Rich, now, um, she's really important in the chapter on Eckhart and the Divine Feminine because she was a wonderful feminist poet um, who wrote in the 70s and 80s. And um, I really use her a lot in that chapter because she she's so profound. And she also wrote an important book, a, a prose book, called Of Women Born, okay. and um, it's all about creativity, and she talks about the goddess as being the um, the archetype of motherhood, really, of mothering and, and creativity, and um, of course, Eckhart is extremely big on creativity, too. He says, what does God do all day long? God lies on a maternity bed giving birth. <laughs> I so, love that. What an image, eh? <laughs> what an image. Oh, and that really makes you the, think. You sit there and think about that. Yeah, wow. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's about the intrinsic creativity of the universe. It's very much backed up by postmodern science. You see that that uh, a new star is being born every 15 seconds, for example, mm. and um, all the birthing that's going on of uh, of uh, galaxies and supernovas and planets in the universe. And, and uh, so, anyway, um, Adrian Rich, though, I just think is so. Well, so rich <laughs> in her uh, naming of the of the feminist tradition, and so I put her in the room with that card, and I think they really uh, they really make sparks together because they both talk a lot about the role of sinking and letting go, and um, it's the and sinking cutting. in that she talked about in a way that really hit me. It, yeah, having experienced yeah. it, but the value she gives it exactly. Mm-hmm. And yet Eckhart uses similar language, and um, and they also talk about the darkness and the nothingness. And um, then I also have a chapter on Eckhart and the Beguine movement of his day, which is the women's movement in the Middle Ages. And the Beguines were neither nuns who were cloistered nor married, but they were single women who who lived together in a community, but without the formal vows. And they worked with the poor and the and the young. And um, and the sick, and they were artisans. Many of them made their living as weavers and green, uh, stained glass window makers and so forth. And um, but he was very influenced. Eckhart was by the Beguines, and they by him. And Dorothy Sola, who's a who died recently, but she was a liberation theologian. Uh, she loved Eckhart, and she said the mystics really deconstruct patriarchy because they get us not to think in terms of hierarchy but in terms of a circle, a web of life, a web of existence. And that's a whole other way of envisioning our our presence on the on the planet. And um I want so she, I want just for everybody who's listening, some of you haven't heard the name the Beguines and it's B E G U I N E S. And uh and Matthew didn't didn't you write that they went on for like two centuries? Oh yeah, they were um they were uh, very viable for many centuries. Um, the Pope, the same Pope who condemned Eckhart a week after he died, condemned the Beguines 17 different times. So clearly, it wasn't sticking that condemnation. Well, all publicity is <laughs> good, right? Even if it's yeah, there, you go. Even then, <laughs> and hundreds of thousands of them were were uh, very alive uh, when he died. So uh, they were especially big in the um, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. And North they Europe. also came from poor homes and so on, didn't they? I mean, they, didn't, yeah, that's right. they were not that's la creme right. de la creme or anything. That's right. That's true. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing they did is they got themselves educated by hanging out with people like Meister Eckhart. Um, uh, they would attend his lectures. They actually, it's thanks to them that we have his sermons. Uh, they actually recorded them for us. Um, and uh, I recorded, of course. <laughs> I don't mean on a recorder. I mean the... They wrote them down for us. 
I know that yeah, he, sort of shook me because they said they memorized them, and I went, "Well, boy, I bet you they were good at that yeah. in those days, eh?" Exactly right. In those days, you didn't have recorders, and people's verbal memories are far better than ours are today. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so they often wrote them down after the the sermon itself, and of course, the sermon on that day was was um, an event because it was kind of the only show in town. Uh, uh, there was no radio and no TV, and uh, so people would flock to good preachers, and Eckhart was the greatest in his time. So people would hang on every word, and uh, and uh, it was easy, pretty easy for them to record what was said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did they have babies and so on? Like, did they have families, or do you know that? The Beguines? No, no, they did not. No, no, they were not uh, married, did not have. You know, some of them were widows, and mm-hmm. they would have had children very likely beforehand because widows were were welcome to join mm-hmm. but as a group no they were um they were celibate from that point of view and they went right into the renaissance period eh well um uh, they kind of did they petered out of course the the black death wiped one third of europeans out uh the who? one third one third of europeans were killed during the black death in the 14th oh, century of course so that made a big dent on everything but um uh, yeah, we actually have some of the big Inages, the places where they lived are, are kind of like museums now in Holland and Belgium, and you can visit them. And uh, uh, But yeah, they, they kind of went out of style. But also, remember, there were no, what we'd call Catholic sisters today, or mm-hmm. what I call third order. Uh, they did not exist back then. Um, if you were a, a sister or a nun, you were in a in uh, in the convent and expected to stay indoors, <laughs> pretty and much. Be sequestered, not, sort of thing, huh? To not be working out with the people, yeah. Yeah, and these yeah, these pushed. nuns were uh, the the Beguines were uh, activists, weren't they? They were exactly, and they were not technically nuns at all, and that's what disturbed the powers that be that they were not easily um, controlled because they were not part of the system. They were a third thing. And it didn't fit into the structures that um, that uh, were operating at that time. So uh, many of them were considered wanton women because they did travel, and they they were outside cloisters, and they didn't take direct orders from popes and bishops. And uh, the fact that the pope condemned them 17 times <laughs> means that that they weren't listening real real hard uh, <laughs> to what he had to say. <laughs> so they were already unimpressed with that, weren't they? They were unimpressed, put it that way. And also the Pope threatened uh, Dominicans and Franciscan priests for working with them, saying that they would be excommunicated for working with the Beguines. Uh, but this did not slow Eckhart down. He did not back down at all. He kept working with the Beguines. And he learned a lot from them, clearly, because um, his language contains a lot of feminist images of the divine feminine and also we've now discovered that one of the beguines who wrote books named Marguerite Perret she was burned at the stake <clears throat> in the early 14th century in the 1300s in Paris and actually Eckhart we have her book now that she wrote and Eckhart uh, quoted from that book quite frequently even after she was burned at the stake so that shows a lot of courage on Eckhart's part that he was quoting from this so-called woman heretic, uh, even after she was burned at the stake. Well, they all had so to have a lot of her. courage to be standing up and and speaking exactly. their, their uh, spiritual truth, right? And so did Exactly, you. and that's why Eckhart's a warrior, and, and those women were warriors. Now, also Eckhart stood up for the peasants, because in his day, German was just the dialect of the peasants. It was not a full-fledged language. He was the first intellectual to preach in German um, and develop his ideas in German. And for that, he was criticized at his trial. We discovered the transcripts of his trial in the 19th century. And um, at his trial, um, they told him, why are you confusing the simple people, uh, telling them in their language that they're other Christs, that they're sons and daughters of God, and um, even to be mothers of God, which is one of his teachings, we're all meant to be other Christ and birthers of Christ. <clears throat> Why are you confusing these people preaching in their own language? They said, uh, they said, if you preach in Latin, we, we'd let you go. 
So Eckhart, he didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. He said, the poor need to learn, for they, if they do not, they will not know how to live or why to die. And 10 years after he said that, the peasant wars broke out in Germany, and tens of thousands of peasants were killed from those wars. So Eckhart was very alert and aware that the gap between the haves and the have-nots was growing ever greater in his country at that time, and he spoke out to support the have-nots. So there are lessons there of warriorhood for our time as well. Well, and yeah, when you say it that way, I, I'm reminded at the very beginning, uh, even just the intro, I was so beside myself with excitement because it made so much sense. But well, um, yeah, what you're saying is, the 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 word is from there is that uh, it's very dangerous right now, and we really have to get conscious faster to make it change. Right? This is not exactly. a trifling time, and exactly. it's a perfect time for him, isn't it? Exactly. Yes, and this warrior energy. And so, I end the book with two chapters on what I call the four E's, which I think are the most pressing issues of our time, including ecology education, a new economics that serves everybody, not only every human on the planet, but all the forests and the waters and the fishes and the oceans and the soil too. And then, of course, ecumenism. And and it's so clear in this book how ecumenical Eckhart is, how Sufis call him a Sufi, and um, Hindus call him a Hindu, and Buddhists call him a Buddhist. Uh, and, and, and couldn't uh, he be included in the atheists? Did I read that? <laughs> well, yeah, he says, I pray God to rid me of God. I think that's what atheists are talking about, too. <laughs> but they, they're they disappointed in the, in the version of God that is often uh, preached uh, by those who say they believe. So we always have to be critique, critiquing our notions of God. Eckhart says, all the ideas of God we have come from uh, an understanding of ourselves. So there's a great danger of projection when it comes to God talk. Well, I think there's this whole thing about authority. It's kind of like the way he was writing it. At a certain time, I was thinking, and even uh, a lot of them actually, is like dropping through the cat's cradle of political uh-huh. in, in, you know, control or domination or whatever you want to call it, right? That's right. Yeah, sure. You're uh, using religion to dominate and to control, and that's why religion so easily goes to bed with fascism because fascism is a, a political construct of control. And um, bad religion is, and the idea of a punitive Father God uh, feeds very much into into those um, those um, efforts to to make it an idol of control. Well, it's funny because if we can be made afraid, we can be controlled, and that's kind of what's going on, isn't it? That's true. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And love is the opposite of fear. So you get to choose. Are you going to be a lover or are you going to be afraid? And uh, once again, this is where that warrior energy comes in, that uh, uh, we have to stand up for what we believe, and uh, and love usually takes the edge and uh, makes demands. Of yourself, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if we really love the earth and future generations, our imaginations would be working overtime to uh, reinvent uh, the footprint that we are, that we're leaving uh, on the earth. Uh, so the imagination would be there if we were in love nearly as much as we claim to be with future generations. I thought it was really interesting talking about imagination, um, going back to what you already said, which is God is uh, in the birth chamber or in the birth bed, right? Mm-hmm. always in a state of creation. And I noticed all the way through that to that admiring imagination and admiring creation is, or really, uh, yeah, really honoring that is a really important part of the evolution of our species, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's where I think education is failing um, so badly. I, I am, I've been working for several years now with inner city kids, and uh, the real question is, why are so many dropping out of school? Mm-hmm. Uh, 65% of black boys are not graduated from high school today in America. And the reason is that they're bored, and creativity, their creativity is not being tapped at all. Um, instead, they're being told they have to take exam upon exam upon exam, and um, that's boring. 
and it's not eliciting the wisdom and the energy and the creativity that's in these young people. So, uh, you know, when there's a budget crunch in education, out goes the theater department and the music and the art. and um, All the imagination that, stimulants. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's the real crisis in education. And uh, Eckhart has some real answers to that because he, he really believes in intuition of the right brain and, and mysticism is that kind of thing. And uh, our system does not honor that. It does not respect it. Even Einstein talked about that. He said that we've been given two gifts, the sacred gift of intuition and the gift of rationality. But he, and rationality, he says, should serve intuition. But he said we live in a culture that honors rationality and has forgotten the sacred gift of intuition. And um, I think he's absolutely right. It's gotten worse since he said those words way back in the 50s. And... Um, uh, I think that's why someone like Eckhart has so much to say today because the mystic is swimming in intuition. And um, and as, that, as uh, Einstein says, values do not come from the intellect. He says uh, values come from intuition and, uh, and feeling, which he says are really the same thing. So uh, this needs to be developed, and our educational systems are not doing a good job at that these days at all. Because again, the authority is money and control, isn't it? It's... Well, that's right, and but it's also patriarchy. It's a left brain bias. The idea that learning is about taking an exam instead of about uh, blossoming and giving birth. And you keep and... calling it wonder. Wonder is a great. I keep loving that. That's a wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's so important, Eckhart, and so important to. Uh, Rabbi Heschel, he says that wonder is, uh, awe and wonder are the beginning of wisdom. So what we need is wisdom education, not just knowledge education. But that requires the balancing of the male and female. The feminists are really coming up with a lot of aspects, right? Exactly, exactly. And we've developed over the years, in my educational programs over 30 years, we, we developed a pedagogy that honors both right and left brain, that honors both intuition and analysis. You can do both, and that's what a healthy school system should be. And I've, we've had tremendous results in my master's and doctorate program, but now, as I say, we're also working with inner-city teenagers, high school kids. What are you doing with, with them, um, Matthew? So, we have a program called Yell Awe, and um, uh, its purpose is precisely this, to go to the, um, the schools where there are heavy drug outs and to offer a model of education that emphasizes creativity over everything else. So we have the kids making movies. We have them painting murals and, uh, of course, poetry and music. And I remember one 18-year-old African-American kid said to me one day, he, he said, in, in four years of high school, he was a senior, this is the first time that anyone has asked me to express myself creatively. Wow. Imagine that. Wow. Four years of high school, and he had never been asked to create to create and um are you seeing them kind of rise into themselves are you seeing them actually maybe not finish Absolutely. school but be retrained into something that gives them sense well of stuff? we we find them finding uh, getting some confidence and uh, we took a, a survey of our kids at the end of the program and 100 percent said they now want to stay in school and why because they experienced the joy of learning and the joy of learning has a lot to do with creativity. It's a lot to do with discovering what's going on inside yourself and sharing it. And when you do that, these kids, any kid, will will come alive. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that they're able to sustain this after they left, uh, or a couple of years after they left their program. Like one of them was an undergrad. You know, he's like a freshman when we had him, and and he went on to another high school and. Um, he didn't like. He said the experience with us was so far superior that um, he was really critical of the high school that he went to. Hmm. So, you know, uh, it's got to. What can I say? These kind of awakenings have to then be supported by other systems and other people, um, or they're just um, they're just brief awakenings. They're not sustainable. If you so, if you have Meister Eckert's. Uh uh, wisdom under underlying or the underpinning of organized whatever, maybe that would be different, huh? 
Yeah, well, again, I think what we have basically are knowledge factories, but not wisdom schools. Mm-hmm. And a wisdom school brings in the feminine, and it brings in the um, the sense of awe and wonder and, and of course, creativity. And uh, there's so little room for that in the structures that we're calling it education right now. But uh, you've got some pretty feisty women in here. Uh, that have oh, yeah. profound wisdom. Are are we women? Uh, are women making enough difference? Are we rising up enough, or are we still succumbing to that patriarchal limiting? Well, it's true. Like in my chapter on education at the end, I have Lily Ye, this wonderful uh, Chinese artist who's worked in the inner city in Philadelphia and as well as in the inner city in China and in Africa, worked with the very poor tribes in Africa, and she just does fabulous work. Again, it's all built around creativity. And M.C. Richards, who comes out of the Rudolf Steiner tradition, she taught for years with me in my programs, and uh, she's a clay, she does clay and, um, and has, uh, has students doing clay and poetry and so forth, and uh, she was a marvelous teacher. But it's not just women. There are many men who have this relationship to the divine feminine and to creativity and to art uh, who are eager to teach as well. And it's very important that boys be exposed to men who are good teachers Mm -hmm. and not just to women. Uh, That's one of the problems we have today. You know, uh, women are far outpacing men in in, uh, attending college and graduating from college today. And while it's, it's a great thing that so women, many women are joining the professions and all this, at the same time, it's scary how many boys and men are falling behind. And part of it is that we are defining, when you define education as taking exams, um, as a rule, girls do better than boys mm-hmm. because um, boys take longer to grow their brains and also they learn more kinetically. They learn more with their bodies by falling off rocks and things. And, and you don't take exams around that stuff. You have to sit still to take an exam. And a lot of boys are being diagnosed as as, um, as diseased, as having some kind of disease, just because they don't want to sit in a desk for seven hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and drone, so well, the listening of the droning of the voices, yeah. Well, exactly. And um, so so it's not just about uh, boys and girls. It, it's about um, uh, getting a balance between masculine and feminine energies. And uh, we can err in in in, uh, in in both directions if we don't if we don't approach this wisely. But I think that also the rising of the feminine in the men as well. I think that has to that has to happen, doesn't it? Like, what yes. do you think about? Well, it this? does. But also, we need to clean up the masculine. See, we have a distorted teaching about the masculine that it's all about being number one. It's all about the reptilian brain, win lose. So I wrote a book a few years ago on the sacred masculine called um, The Hidden Spirituality of Men, Ten Metaphors to Awaken the Sacred Masculine. And it's about bringing back the balance. The last two chapters are about the marriage of the divine feminine and the sacred masculine, the sacred marriage. That's what we want. So it's wonderful that the divine feminine has come back and that women have um, banded together and, and done a lot of their inner work to bring back the divine feminine. Now, though, the men have to get more critical of what we're calling masculinity in our culture and get a healthier sense of the masculine and how it relates to the divine feminine as well. Because it and has to fact, be nurturing, doesn't it? It has to be because of the nature of the way the world is right now. Exactly. And yeah. uh, the, the reptilian brain is triumphing still. And um, we have to make room for that mammal brain, which is the brain of compassion and uh, intuition and um kinship and uh and and um also mm-hmm. creativity that's really wonderful also um do you think that as a species you know the kind of uh layers and layers of what the human consciousness is and subconscious and all that do you think it's rising this rebalancing do you think it's rising in us in a massive level or do you think it's like it's time has come well um there certainly has been an awakening to the divine feminine uh, in many quarters in, in my lifetime, the last 40 years or so, which, which is very positive. But it still has a long, long way to go, as we know. And uh, 
uh, many women around the world are still um, treated as third-class citizens and all the rest. Um, and as I say, still our institutions, including education, are, are still wedded to a patriarchal uh, consciousness that is dated and that is not cutting the mustard, it's not doing the job, and this is why uh, many people are dropping out, and and also why it's so expensive. When, when something is not really useful and doing its job, the price goes up. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's <laughs> really no interesting because in even... And even jobs, they'll say, well, there are, aren't any jobs. So why would somebody endure all that, you know? Right, yeah. That, that's really but, an important thing. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and again, men have to become more, more critical and, and also more aware of their potential. Uh, one response to my book on the sacred masculine was from a Native American who told me he had been working in prisons for 12 years, and he said, mine was the first book that got men to look inside and find the nobility inside. He said, um, most men in prison project on others, and they don't want to look inside, mm. and it's very hard to get them to do so, but the method in my book was to take 10 um, archetypes or metaphors of the sacred medicine, such as Father Sky or Green Man, or spiritual warrior, or hunter-gatherer, um, or fatherhood, or grandfatherhood, the, the elder, and so forth. And so th- that's how the book is divided in those chapters. And he said these uh, metaphors really got them looking inside and, and finding the nobility inside. I think that's a powerful, powerful phrase. And that's really key, I think, to to men under patriarchy, men too have suffered because they've not found the nobility inside. They've been told to obey, to get in line, to go into the mines and into the factories and into war and to kill, kill others yeah. and kill. And uh, so it's been an appeal to the reptilian brain. It's not been an appeal to the whole um, person of what a human being is, what a man can be. Now, one of the responses I got to the book, the very first one from a woman. She said, I have over 200 books on the goddess in my library at home, not a single book on the sacred masculine. Wow. And she said, I have, I have two sons. She said, I didn't realize until I read your book how, how much men have suffered under patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been working for 40 years, she said, on, on my womanhood and recovering the divine feminine, and I don't regret any of that. But she said, I, I agree with you now. The next step of feminism is we have to support the men to do more soul searching as well. Mm-hmm. To realize that they can create. Uh, exactly. Wow, because they are very strong and wise. Tell me about creation spirituality. What is that? That's uh, part of your baby, right? Well, yeah, it's the um, alternative tradition uh, within Christianity. It's It's uh, been a, a unwanted stepson for centuries, <laughs> but um, it doesn't begin with original sin. Uh, which is not only bad news and pessimistic, but is also anthropocentric. It begins with creation itself and with original blessing. And, of course, this one of my... I like that, books, original blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you like it. The Pope didn't. That, that really got the Pope riled up. Um, That's a little bit of good publicity right too. there. <laughs> That's true. That gave you some good publicity. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, they have, a, some people in the Vatican have a real investment in original sin. Even though Jesus never heard of it, had no Jews ever heard of original sin, and Jesus did not preach of original sin. So it's a distortion of, of the tradition, and yet it's, it's running still of most of the, of, the, of the Christian churches. And um, so, anyway, uh, this tradition is feminist because. Um, Israel, from which it comes, uh, wisdom is feminine in in the Bible. Uh, Hokma in Hebrew and Sophia in Greek are feminine, and uh, she's feminine around the world. And she's also uh, all about the sacredness of creation, the revelation, in fact, that nature is. And um, so, like Thomas Aquinas, 13th century, who is in this tradition, he says that uh, revelation comes in two volumes: nature. And the Bible, but if we if we say Revelation is only in the Bible, we leave out all of nature, and it also means that we're anti-scientific because 
scientists are the ones who teach us about nature. So they're there. Therefore, they're teaching us about the revelation that nature is if we listen carefully instead of fight them all the time. Um, and of course, Hildegard, being in the great 12th century mystic and reformer and musician and genius, she was very creation centered too. And of course, Meister Eckhart uh, is, is a real champion in this regard. Eckhart says, uh, he says, every creature is a, is a, uh, a source of revelation and a book about God. Uh, so he's saying every single creature is a Bible. He says, if I spend enough time with a caterpillar, I'd never have to prepare a sermon because one caterpillar is so full of God. So he too comes from this wisdom tradition and from the creation spiritual tradition of the Bible. So I wonder, you know, as we're speaking of this, I wonder about uh, if we had uh, grown up with the awareness that God is in every blade of grass, you know, that kind of creation. I wonder yeah. if we wouldn't have treated our planet a lot better at this time. Absolutely, absolutely, no. One reason there is an ecological crisis is that people like Augustine, who are dualistic, separated nature from grace and said, all oh, nature has fallen and all the rest, and and he set science back. Uh, he said, you know, in effect, he was saying we don't have to learn from science because somehow uh, our belief alone is enough. And uh, one one uh, Nobel-winning scientist, a chemist, said that Augustine set science back a thousand years wow. by that kind of teaching. Um, Augustine, uh, Aquinas broke with Augustine, and um, and and Augustine was following Plato, whereas Aquinas followed Aristotle, and he said, "I prefer Aristotle to Plato because Aristotle does not denigrate matter." Mm. So this, and that's a very feminist perspective you see that matter is not is not um, something uh, negative something um, to push against matter go right? together. yeah what's that something to push against it seems like when people something to push do. against yeah 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 so that's and a scapegoat we make a scapegoat out of, out of matter yeah but um so you've got today. um here we've got all these different all the different religions and um, I mean, you've done a lot of research, haven't you? Mm-hmm. A lot of study. Cause... Well, yeah, and what's that's what's so uncanny about Eckhart. He's so unique that that I don't know anyone else ever about whom a Sufi would say Eckhart is a Sufi, a Christian would say he's a Christian, a Buddhist says he's Buddhist, Hindus say he's Hindu, and uh, and he also has long time with black elk. And, and uh, indigenous traditions. He's unique, and that's why I, I think we're in a unique position today to be um, appreciative of him and to be nurtured by him. And I think that's why he speaks so deeply to people today, including yourself. Oh, yeah. um, and the fact that he brings in the divine feminine in a very, very strong and very balanced way. So uh, did he do? Did he use ritual? You, you, you had. Uh, I was watching some of your videos as well. And you were talking about doing rituals and ceremonies. Yeah. And I was thinking, for, for example, for young boys, there's very little ritualizing your manhood sort of thing. You know, did he uh, did he get did he participate in that? Well, of course, in his day, you had the mass and in uh, the sacraments, you had confirmation and so forth. But um, uh, today, of course, we have many new languages. So I'm very involved in trying to renew worship um, in what we call the Cosmic Mass. We just did one two weeks ago at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco for about 800 people. Mm. And what we're doing is we're bringing in the new uh, languages of DJing and VJing and rap and dance. And, um, of course, dance is not new. Dance is a very old way to pray, but it seems new because in the modern era, people were not invited to dance in church. Um, and to bring their bodies to church, we were busy turning pages and reading texts and be having texts read to us and keeping your body out. under total control, right? Exactly. So <laughs> we've been doing these cosmic masses now since I became an Episcopal priest 16 years ago, and we've done over 97 of them now, and um, um, we're very excited about the results. Not just young people, but young and old together uh, can. Uh, derive so much benefit from healthy ceremony and healthy ritual. 
uh, Melodo Misomi, the African spiritual teacher, says there is no uh, no community without ritual. Mm. So r- having strong ritual is very important. And we have these new ways to pray today. Many of them come from the rave movement. The and, rave um, movement. You mentioned they, that. Why is that? I don't yeah. know much about it. Well, a, a rave is an all-night celebration that young people go to, and it's about having a trance. It's about going into a trance. And really, that's what Richard should do for you. should take you to another place. Now, unfortunately, a lot of rape today has succumbed to the drug thing, but it wasn't that way when it began. And it's not that way, certainly, when we employ some of their their methods into our worship. We have no, there's no drug allowed. But uh, things happen, profound things. For example, in response to our Mass the other day at, at Grace Cathedral, a woman came up to me and she said, um, I am from um, uh, Ontario, Canada, and she said, we just closed down the Anglican Cathedral there. It's 150 years old and a very be- uh, beautiful building, but there were no one there except old people. She said they couldn't sustain it. But here, you said, she said, at this event, you have people of all ages mixing and singing and dancing, and uh, you know, there's real life here where there is there is complete death back there at our cathedral in Canada. So, um, yeah, a lot of people um, are looking for ritual today. This is why Burning Man, 60,000 people go out in the summer to the desert for a a ritual called Burning Man. Why do they do that? Because ritual is is part of the human condition. We need it for community. We need it for healing. We need it for celebration, for creativity, for joy. Well, tell me, what what kind of music do you use in the Cosmic Mass? Do you use Well, we use DJs. Okay. We use DJs, electronic music a lot, but we also have uh, live music as well. Um, we have sometimes drums and sometimes people singing with a hand drum, kind of shamanistically. Uh, one of our recent masses, we had a a group of uh, native uh, singers singing indigenous songs um, at the beginning and at the end with a big drum. Hmm. Um uh, uh, we even had a piano at our, our mass at Grace Cathedral, but we also had the DJ doing electronic music. So we combine. It, it's you know ours are times of mixing, and so we combine different forms of music, um, and chanting, and singers uh, are leading us in chant. And at our Grace Cathedral mass, this uh, wonderful folk singer Jennifer Barrett's on led us in several songs. And um, and she also did the teaching for us. So yeah, we 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 do a great variety of, of music. Wow, this is this is such great news. Uh, is it yeah. going to is it a the actual dance? Is electronic dance with the DJ? We mm-hmm. do that twice for about eighteen minutes each time. And do you see people here. going into big trances themselves? <laughs> um, well, we we get you that know kind people of feedback. seeing for things example, and so on. Well, we have a a grief part in every one of our cosmos we do grieving and uh, instead of a confession of sins we do grieving and we have a, a practice that we help people to grieve we get down on all fours and so on and this is very powerful and after the last mass i'd say at least eight people came out to me most of them women one of them was a native american woman thanking me just for the grief part alone they said it was so important and so powerful one woman told me that her husband had died um, several months ago, and that this was finally she felt a breakthrough in her grieving process and so forth. Being able to grieve with others is something she said I've never really done before. So grief is a very important issue today. We're not going to release our creativity, which is our only hope of of um, salvation as a species. Uh, we're not going to release creativity if we can't grieve. Because when your grief is, you're stuck in grief, and everyone's grieving today, but they don't know what to do about it. The churches Mm -hmm. are not helping, and not everyone can talk to a therapist. And besides, talking is not the best way to deal with grief anyway. No. It's it's literally gut wrenching, isn't it? Exactly. You have to, exactly, you have to unleash this this bottleneck in our third chakras, which is, as you say, the gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. So we do that. Yeah, because one of the things I read, and I think it was with Adrian Rich, but she was talking about grief as being, uh, she didn't put it this way, but like a portal into your deeper spiritual being, right? 
Yes. Um, yeah, she, she addresses grief, too, definitely. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm really glad you're doing that. Well, I think we're almost drawing to a close. Where are you? You're in San Francisco area, and you're doing... Uh, you're at Grace Cathedral most of the time, are you? No, 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 no. I, I'm not there very often. But um, no, I, I live in Oakland, mm-hmm. and, which is across the bay from San Francisco. And um, people could go online, matthewfoss.org, and see where I'm speaking. Uh, but I speak in many places. I'm on my way to Korea this weekend in Australia. The Koreans have translated about half a dozen of my books. Wonderful. And I've uh, never lectured there before. But uh, people can find out where I'm at uh, by going to my web page, and there's a pretty updated schedule there. Also, our next Cosmic Masses, um, the next one we know we're doing for sure will be in October here in the in the East Bay. In will you? And will you be doing some in Korea as well and in Australia? No. Okay. No, 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 I won't be doing the Cosmic Masses. I'll be lecturing. You'll Korea. be lecturing. Yeah. And you also give classes sometimes, eh, for creation? Um, right. Yes, that's true. And we're talking about starting up our Dr. Ministry program again very soon. So people should uh, stay tuned. Again, you can go to the webpage, MatthewFox.org, and they can find out what's, what's cooking. Well, I am so grateful that you had time for us today and uh, and bless you for all you're teaching us. And I'm going to get into more of Meister Eckhart books, although this, <laughs> one, this one by you is such a... It's really rich, and the people that you're um, bringing together with Meister Eckert are all worthy of studying as well. I mean, they just open you like a book. Well, I'm 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 glad to hear that, Veronica, and I encourage you. And thank you for your having your radio program. It's a great thing to be able to talk about these uh, mysteries at this time in history. It's so important that we open ourselves up to some of the wise figures like Eckhart and become mystic warriors ourselves. Yeah, because it occurred to me that these emanations of wisdom that come from them frequency-wise are really penetrating our culture now. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? I hope so. I hope so. We need it. We need it. We <laughs> well, need all the help we can get. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you so much for coming on to Paradigm Shifters. Many, many blessings thank on you, your Ron. trip. Thank you. Bye now. Goodbye. Bye now. Goodbye. Bye now. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.